Today we are going to be going neck deep, all right? And so I'm going to have you follow with me. It will be on the screen. I do want you getting uh, comfortable using your Bible. If you have a print edition Bible, wonderful. If it's on your phone, wonderful. I don't care how you use your Bible. Get to know how to use it, all right? And so as we are going through today, we are going to be covering a good bit of, of, of Scripture. And we're going to start kind of where we left off last week with the statement that was made in Joshua about why they did what they did. Why is it that it was okay for the Israelites to do the things that they did? And not just okay, but it was right. And if they did not do it, they would be out of the will of God. And I am a guy who likes to think about some stuff. And just because somebody says, well, it's the will of God kind of sometimes rubs me the wrong way because I've seen people do things and cover it with, well, it's God's will. And I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. How does it line up with his word? How does it line up with the affirmation of the Holy Spirit? How does it line up in life? So don't just believe me because I said it's the will of God. Check, test it, look in Scripture. Don't buy a bald guy's word just because I'm standing on a stage higher than you are sitting currently, all right? There's nothing authoritative about altitude. <laughs> there is something authoritative about God's Word, and I want us to know it. I want us to know what it says, and I don't want us just to look at it and try to fit it into what we believe. I want our beliefs to be measured against what God reveals. So today we're going to be processing some Scripture. And it says this in Joshua Joshua then turned back and captured Hazor and killed its king. Hazor had, at one time, been the capital of all these kingdoms. We talked last week about the fact that the Israelites had conquered multiple, multiple kingdoms. And the Israelites completely destroyed every living thing in the city, leaving no survivors. We talked last week about how in that one passage, there were six times that that statement was made, leaving no survivals, survivors. Not a single person was spared. And then Joshua burned the city. Joshua slaughtered all the other kings and their people, completely destroying them, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Who commanded it? Moses. Man, I wish I knew where Moses got that command. We'll, we'll find that out shortly. But the Israelites did not burn any of the towns built on mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. And the Israelites took all the plunder and livestock of the ravaged towns for themselves, but they killed all the people, leaving no survivors. As the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua. And Joshua did what he was told, carefully obeying all the commands that the Lord had given to Moses. we have a tendency to experience an exceedingly peaceful life here in the United States. There are some in this room who know that that peace comes at the price of lives and quite a bit of violence, and that has always been the case. Just so you know, the rest of the world does not quite experience the same kind of peace that we experience that you get to come into this place and nobody even yelled at you for going to church. Nobody looked sideways at you for coming in here and certainly nobody shot at you. Anybody get shot at as you were coming to church today? No? Okay. That's an that's a interesting thing that is outside of the norm for Christianity throughout history. And because of that, we have a look at reality that is very, very childlike, I would think. And when we read a passage like Joshua killed everyone, there were no survivors, and God commanded him to do that, we go, I don't like Old Testament God. He's kind of a meanie. Give me some Jesus, Pastor. Let's get into John. Let's read about the gospel. Because I'm uncomfortable here. 
what could possibly justify God giving a command that this level of carnage is not just what is okay, it's what you are supposed to do. Now, let me tell you something. I am not giving any of you a command today to go out and do carnage on other people. I am not doing that today. If you misinterpret, that is now recorded. It will be on the internet. There's proof that I didn't give you permission to go murder people. Okay? That is not what I'm talking about. I am, however, wanting to know personally and share with you why God would be that hardcore about what he commanded his people to do. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so there's, there's some things I want to say before we get into all that, and it's this. I said last week that we had to go back in order to understand how to move forward with understanding this heavy passage and the issues that, that surround it. And as we, as we do this, I have a request for you this morning. You see, there are, uh, like Noelani said, there Different people have these different experiences, and it is required of us as Christians that we walk through this life intending peace in the name of Jesus and fighting for peace in the name of Jesus, which usually means fighting ourselves, giving up our rights so that others can know Jesus, not defending our rights and saying, well, you're wrong, I'm right, I have the right to be right, and I'm going to teach you how right I am. Okay, buddy, let's, let's breathe a little bit. We have a, a requirement to walk in that peace according to the Gospels, but there is also in the Gospel the same thing that we see in this, and so my request is this, because there are many people that have many different backgrounds, I want to be aware of that personally as I preach, but it, that will not soften the things that God wants to say. I do, however want you to hear this. If I read some passages this morning that you go, yes, pastor, preach it. Keep that inside for now and pray. Because there may be people in this room that this is speaking to so heavily that it is fingernails on a chalkboard to their soul. So instead of, yes, pray. God, let your Holy Spirit own this time and speak in this place. And if this is nails on the chalkboard to you, my, my request is this, and it's the same. Pray. God, I don't like this. I want your will, not mine. I'm trying to remember who said that. Might have been Jesus when he knew that the most violent thing was going to be happening to him shortly, he prayed that because his desire was, God, I do not really want to go through this, but I know the necessity of what is going to take place, so not my will but yours be done. And so for everybody in this room, my instruction to you this morning is pray. Pay attention, yes, and pray, okay? So let's keep going. I want you to receive God's word this morning. I want you to hear it and let it work on you. Because there are pieces of this that I see we as a Christian church in general, also here specifically, struggle with the balance of this. And as we talk through this morning, I hope that God will help you in this. In Genesis chapter 19, this is us going back, by the way. Genesis, I'm sorry, wow, somebody's getting old. Genesis chapter 15, I need longer arms. Who's with me? Longer arm people? Yeah, okay. 15, 16, it's an iPad, I can zoom in. Woo, look at that. So helpful. This is what God says to Abraham. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land, for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. We read last week that the people that the Israelites went in to fight against were who? The Amorites. 
The Amorites is a name for a conglomeration of tribes and kingdoms that were in the promised land. And the things that they did are actually listed in Leviticus. We're going to kind of get there here in a little bit. But as you go through today, I do want you to read these things for yourselves and see if I am taking them out of context and trying to make my own point or if this is the point that Scripture makes. I want you to measure that. Okay? And if you have disagreement with me today, my request is this. Talk to me afterward. I would love to delve deeper into this. But I want us to understand that this has been something that has been going on for 400 years. Because in this passage, there's a promise and a judgment. You're going to be away for 400 plus years, and then you will come back. You will come back to do my will when the time is right. And what is the right time? It's when judgment is necessary. 400, listen. How many of you remember talking with Abraham Lincoln? Oh, that's right. None of us were there. But that's like a long time ago in American history, right? That's not even half of the time that they were slaves in Egypt. And so we have a hard time thinking through God's timeline. On a, on a regular basis, we struggle with this. And so when God is doing justice... In his time, sometimes it's not our time. But God tells Abraham, you're going to go away, your family's going to grow, you're going to multiply like I said you would. If you can count the stars in the sky, that's how many descendants you'll have. All of those wonderful promises were in there, but there's also in there judgment. And if you have your notes and you want to fill some stuff in and, and write some things down and try to uh, process this later, the first one is this, it's a promise and a judgment. But in, in fact, if we're going to understand the fullness of this, we need to go back even further in Genesis to find out why this is justified. But a question for you. How many of you have ever made something for yourself? Like, I made a trailer four years ago now. I ran into it yesterday at the property and bent something, and Rocky and Rick were there to... That sounds like a show. Rocky and Rick. Um... <laughs> But that trailer I built for my purpose, I built it the way I wanted it because I didn't want a trailer that was super high wall that I have to reach over because, you know, I'm not getting younger and someday I don't want to have to climb in a trailer. But I, I, built it, I built it way too heavy because I wanted it to last until my kids' kids were still using They go, oh, I remember great-grandpa built this. That literally, I was thinking that as I'm welding it. Who gets to use that trailer? Me. Who gets to decide who else gets to use that trailer? Me. It was built for my purpose. Every time I use it, I go, good grief, I loved the fact that today I got to use something that three years ago I made for this purpose today that I didn't even know this purpose was going to come. But moving us, Rick was actually in Rocky, we're moving stuff from the church to the property so that there's more space for us at the church. I didn't know that was going to be a reality when I built that trailer, but I built it for my purposes. It's actually titled in the state of Arizona under my name. It's mine. If that's true for a stupid trailer, it, it's just a hunk of metal with some rubber things that spin around on it. If that's true for a trailer, who gets to decide whose we are, our purpose. Who gets to decide that? This is not a trick question, people in church this morning. I'm asking it out loud. I want you to respond out loud. Who gets to decide your purpose? God. And this morning, if you came and you're like, I'm just checking this place out and I don't know about these weird Christian people, I get to decide who it is that makes decisions for me. Cool. Listen, I'm glad you're here this morning. I would love for you to meet the Jesus that I know. And I believe this, and I will not hold it back. You are actually God's. And he gets to decide what you do. Ultimately, according to what Scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
that's my belief. That's what the Bible says. And so in that process, you may not agree with me, and it's totally okay to not agree with me. I've been wrong once. Just, no, not just once. But in Genesis chapter 1, God says this in verse 26, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. If you read back through the creation account, it says, let this come forward from the land. Let this come forward. That's interesting. But God made us in his image. He didn't make anything else in his image. Now, there's a lot of things we can get into in that image thing, and we're going to touch on a little bit of it. But the bottom line reality of human life is that we are not our own. We were made by a maker, and the maker gets to decide what he made and what it does. One of the really interesting things is that I believe wholeheartedly that God gave us, the ones that he made, free will. And that has consequence. And it's consequence he knew. He wasn't surprised by free will, by the way. But he made us. And the purpose for which we were made, and I've heard other people say we were made for worship, and then I read the Bible and I go, it doesn't say that people worshiped God until like chapter 9. So I think that's following an original purpose, and the original purpose that I see in Scripture was that God wanted to be in relationship with us. That's our purpose. We were made to be in relationship with Him. We were made to be in right relationship with Him. And so as we look at this, let's then go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. It says this, after the flood, after God saw all the evil that humanity had gone to after the fall of man, after they decided to go against God's will, evil just propagated. And I know that doesn't happen still. I know everybody's a good person really today. No. But God says this, if anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Man, this is the second time that in Genesis we see that God's word says we were made in his image. We were made for his purpose. What is this image? And this is a, I'm going to give you a Latin term today, and you can say, I learned Latin this week when you go to the water cooler and lean up against it. And it just hit me that we need a water cooler in here because now the school is out of session and the air conditioners will not come on. I got to talk faster. All right. <laughs> I can see some of you like, it's Sunday nap time because it's 900. Stay with me. Stay with me. All right. But this term, imago Dei, in the image of God, Nothing else on the planet. Dogs are wonderful. I have a dog named Loki and a dog named Lily. We had a dog named Thor. I love our dogs. They are not made in God's image. You may have a dog that is part of your family. I get that. That, that dog's not made in God's image. It was made by God, yes. But we specifically are, are different in this way. That... Being made in the image of God has some pieces to it that I think are very important, and part of that importance is that our purpose was to be in relationship with Him. I don't believe any of my dogs have ever thought, I wonder if Jesus died for me. They haven't gone there. Do they, would they recognize God as God if He walked in? I bet they would, because even the rocks will cry out. If we don't, and I think my dog's just, sometimes just a little smarter than a rock. Not a lot, but a little. <laughs> some of you have dogs and you know. Some are smart, some are rocks. <laughs> but this image of God in which we were made has some consequence, has some gravity, some weight to it. And King David says this in Psalms while praising God. He said, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. And as I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. 
Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. David is a fascinating Old Testament character to me, by the way, because David is one of the primary people in the Old Testament that has a really solid grasp of God. Not just God the Father that, like, everybody in the Old Testament kind of gets because they were looking forward to the Messiah, but they hadn't yet seen Jesus. But David understood the Holy Spirit to be God. And the things that were revealed to him in his process of growing and maturing in his faith are pieces that in the Old Testament, I see very few others have this kind of understanding of the Holy Spirit. And David gets this, and he understands, and I want us to understand what David did, that God intends each life. Well, what if the people that made that baby didn't intend that life? That's okay. Guess what? Jamie and I got pregnant about three weeks after we got married. Was that our intent? <laughs> Listen, I've told you I have trouble planning. But God knew. And we have a son named Josiah, and we have a son named Jonah, and we have a daughter named Sophia, and God knew them because he intended them. You happen to be breathing oxygen today because God intended you. He has a per You were not like, oh, shoot, Bill showed up. I didn't know Bill was coming. God has never been surprised by that, and because of that, if what David says is true of himself, I believe it is also true of each one of us. God intends each life, and I believe this also, that his desire is to redeem every life to himself. We have a purpose repossessing Tucson and all of southern Arizona with the love of Jesus Christ starting right here in Sarita. That's what we as a church intend to do. All, not part. I want everybody, not just in Sarita, but in all of southern Arizona, everything that, and that seems way too big for me, by the way. But that's what God wants for us. And he's, he, that, that call is not for us to say, mm, well, this person's just too much of a sinner, but that one looks real close to Jesus. Let me go help them out. No, no. It's God's will that all, the furthest from himself, those who have committed heinous acts that are uh, even against our own laws, does God want to redeem that? Absolutely. Does God want to redeem the worst thing you have ever done by redeeming you? Absolutely he does. Every single one of us that is true for. I told Rick this week that in junior high, me and two other young men, in our wisdom, we're really huge jerks, and we made a woman retire by whistling in class. You don't think that's possible, do you? <laughs> Three weeks straight. Three guys, and when she would come to one of us, one of us would stop, and the other two would continue. In junior high, I was not Jesus' kid yet, okay? I know that. And that, still to this day, I feel horrible. Now, is that the worst thing I've ever done? No, that's just what I can share in church. <laughs> and, you know, I learned that skill because there was a bully in Kentucky that always would grab my this and say, whistle or lose it. You know how you learn to whistle without your lips? <laughs> and then a bully stops, and that... Then I had this skill that I used for evil later on. And all of those things God wants to redeem. All the, now, that's a stupid example. I get that. But there are horrible things that you may not have told anybody else in your life about that you have done. And God knows, and he loves you, and he wants to redeem you, and he wants to redeem those things. And so this morning as we go through this, I want you to hear that God is not sitting in judgment yet. He is extending grace to each one of us. 
Let's go to Numbers chapter 3, verse 13. Because I want us to understand more of God's heart and mind. Numbers is one of the most fascinatingly boring books that you could possibly ever read right after Leviticus in the list of boring things to read, unless you understand God's heart. When you start understanding God's heart, you begin to see what's in Numbers and Leviticus and go, God cares about every single one of the little details, including the little details of my life. He knows and he cares, and he wants to be with me in them. But he says this in chapter 3, verse 13 of Numbers, For all the firstborn males are mine. On the day I struck down all the firstborn sons of Egypt, I set apart for myself all the firstborn of Israel, both of people and of animals. They are mine, I am the Lord. When God says, I am the Lord, he's saying, I'm done talking now, do what I said. Now, the way this played out was that the firstborn animals of every one of the herds that the Israelites were ever to own for all of perpetuity, all time, was to be sacrificed to God so that there was not a trust in the provision of an animal for the riches of the people, but that the first thing that came from any animal was God's. Now, when that came to humans, God didn't want us cutting the throat of the son or daughter who was born first. There was a buyback, a redeeming that would happen, that an animal would be given in place of the son so that that son or daughter would be still in the family and part of the people of Israel. God was not big on just asking people to kill their kids. He only did that to one. That was Abraham, and that was a test, and God did not intend Abraham ever to kill his son. He wanted to make sure that he was ready to be in a relationship of equals with himself because God would give his son. And so in that process of revealing to his people that the first things, their mind, they are sanctified as holy unto me. And some of you firstborns are like, yeah, I am. And all you secondborns are like, they're clearly not. The second born. Um, but there is something that God is showing us in this, that there is a sanctity of the first things. That he's saying, don't depend on the things. Depend on me. Give the first things back to me. With that in mind, all of this is the backdrop of the judgment of the Amorites. And you thought I got lost in my sermon. I didn't. We're going back to the Amorites now. Why is it okay for God to tell the Israelites to completely annihilate, to bring an absolute level of judgment on the Amorites? I do want you to keep in mind all the stuff I just said, so please don't forget it. All of that is the judgment of the backdrop or the backdrop of the judgment of the Amorites, and an intent by God that his people never engage in the acts that the Amorites did on a regular basis. And not just like they were new to it, they had been doing it for literally four centuries at this point. And he made his will known, not just to Abraham, but through Abraham to the people around him. And they disregarded it, and God moved Abraham and his family out of that area, but promised that they would come back when the sin of the Amorites had reached what was necessary for judgment to happen. So his will was known. So what is the sin of the Amorites? If we want to understand this, we need to be back in Leviticus, so we're going to go there in just a little bit. But the list of sins of the Amorites, uh, as well as the other people in that area, are found in Leviticus and include a, vo a variety of sexual deviancy and all that kind of stuff. And there's somebody I care about deeply who is now involved in the justice side of all of the bad things that happen in our town. And some of you are law enforcement, and I thank you, and I pray for you on a regular basis. I don't say that lightly. I pray for you on a regular basis. That God will give you wisdom. He will give you strength, and he will give you protection. Because our world didn't just get better one day. It's still evil. Those of you that have experienced that because you're in law enforcement, you know. <laughs> it's getting better every day, right? No, because you still have jobs. And so... This stuff that is there, 
It wasn't just back then, but they would do things like worshiping idols and the way they would worship idols. We think of idol worship like we see it in Hollywood movies, like somebody bows down and there's a little thing and they just pray and they light a candle and it's very almost Catholic. It's not the idols that they worshiped in the promised land before the Israelites got there. The idols they worshiped were sex gods. Most of them, they were fertility gods. There's Ishtar, there's Molech. How in the world do you worship a, a sex god? Any ideas? Yeah, it was all disgusting. It was all wrong. And God has some very specific ideas because he designed us about what sex was supposed to be. And he made it, and he made it well, by the way. Sex in the right covenant relationship, it's good. Outside of that, it's destructive. And God gave his people specific instructions. If you want to read some non-PG scripture, go to Leviticus. And see what God told his people not to do, because that's what the people around them were doing. The Amorites were doing all of the things listed in these passages in Leviticus. In Leviticus 18 specifically, if you want to go there, 18 and 19, there were all kinds of things taking place. They were marrying their mothers. They were marrying their sisters. They were engaging in things that we today consider taboo. They were doing things that we today have said, oh, that's okay too. And God says, wait, it's there. And he lists these out like, no, orgies? That's no, no bueno. Don't, no, that's, that's not covenant relationship with 19 other people. That's not how I designed it. It goes through all of these pieces in Leviticus. Bestiality, temple prostitution, worshiping of idols with sex, also worshiping idols with the sacrificing of your children. The Bible tells us that it says that they passed them through the fire. That was, that was the way they worshiped Molech back then, was passing a child through the fire. What does that mean? Like, like when you're sitting at Olive Garden and they light the candle and you pass your hand over it? Is that... No, it literally means burning your child alive as a sacrifice to Molech. I don't, God's not okay with that. Why? Because he intended each life. And he does not want that life to be given to something else. Worship of idols, homosexuality, orgies, temple prostitution, bestiality, they were guilty of all of those things, including sacrificing their children to Molech. Literally, these things that God saw the Amorites doing, he said, people of mine, I have designed you differently. I have a value of life, and I have a specific value that's a, a sanctity issue with the first of everything. And it's fascinating to me that as we start applying this to today, I, I look at what is happening in our country with what has happened for the last 50 plus years legally with abortion. And as a man, some would say, well, you don't even have a right to talk about that. I'm sorry, the Bible does. And so as a pastor, I'm gonna, that this stuff that, as I even apply this and say, man, when I look in the lives of young people who are making a decision that comes after a decision they made to have sex, and the result of that quite often is that there's a baby that comes. And the first of somebody's womb has a tendency in this country to be sacrificed. Not to God, not given to God as something holy, but sacrifice because there's many reasons. And some will give argument to health and these different things, and I, I gotta say, are we gods or are we not God's kids? And as a pastor, this is something I gotta tell you. I get more flack for talking about two things in this world. God's position on life and God's position on marriage. 
And I'm not crying because it's hard on me. I'm crying because it breaks the heart of God. And it enslaves us. And he wants to redeem us. And he can redeem us. And it doesn't matter how enslaved we have been. He can, wants to, and will redeem us if we will let him. In chapter 18, verse 24, God says this, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, for the people I am driving out before you have defiled themselves in all of these ways. Because the entire land has become defiled, I am punishing the people who live there. I will cause the land to vomit them out. You must obey all my decrees and regulations. You must not commit any of these detestable sins. This applies both to the native-born Israelite and to the foreigners living among you. And I, I have even heard Christians argue, well, some of that stuff is Old Testament. But even in this passage, it says this is for the Israelites and the foreigners. Unless you're a Hebrew by birth, you are counted as a foreigner. That's me. I don't know that I have any Israelite blood in me. I am a foreigner grafted into God's family through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for me and the redemption he provided for me. And he wants you grafted into his family as well. And his regulations, yes, there are some that are specifically for the Israelites. I literally could not be an Israelite standing before you right now because one, I shave my head, and two, I'm not wearing something to cover it. And in America, we have this culture that, man, you're inside, take your hat off. Where for the Israelites, to be uncovered before the Lord ever is a sin. And so, yes, there are pieces that are applicable only for the Israelites, but this says, this applies both to the native-born Israelite and to the foreigner living among you. And so this is for us. And then in Leviticus 20, 1 through 3, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Give the people of Israel these instructions, which apply both to native Israelites and to the foreigners living in Israel. If any of them offer their children as sacrifices to Molech, they must be put to death. The people of the community must stone them to death. I myself will turn against them and cut them off from the community because they have defiled my sanctuary and brought shame on my holy name by offering their children to Molech. If God was that hardcore about what he created not being offered to some other God, has God changed? I don't believe he has. And I, I don't stand up here today to preach some political thing. I stand up here today to preach God's word that God loves us. And he is wanting to redeem even those of us who have sacrificed children to whatever thing it was, does he have redemption for that? Oh my goodness, yes. I will not give other people's testimony, but other people can testify about what God has done in their lives when they surrendered to him and the healing he has brought and the overpouring blessing he has brought in his process of redemption as well. And so, if you're being pricked by this today, I am praying for you that you are not offended and turned away from God, but that you are called to him to say, you know what? There have been some things in my life that I have done that I have even defended before, but I will give to him now and ask what he wants to do with it. That's my prayer, that's my hope, because I believe on the other side of that prayer is the redemption that God has, the new life that God has for you, the freedom that he made you for is on the other side of that. I believe God is calling us to be a people who are different than the world around us, that we believe differently, that we think differently, and that we act differently. And I've had people argue with me even about, well, really the issue is when is life life? Man, I wish the Bible said something about that. Doggone it, it does. For the life of the body is in its blood. This is Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. I have given you 
the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given exchange for a life that makes purification possible. If that's true, and if you want to debate with me about the application of the scripture, I would love to talk with you. I don't have any desire for a debate, but I would love to talk with you because I then got this thought, okay, what if life is in the blood, when does that start happening? In the life of a human fetus development, any guesses on what day blood starts coursing in that child's body? Not quite day one, because there's only two cells. It takes a little more than two cells. About day 18. Guess when we can know that we're pregnant? I mean, I can't know I'm pregnant. That doesn't work that way. <laughs> but ladies, guess when we can know you are pregnant? Right about day 18. And so as soon as we know there's life possible, according to Scripture, life is in the blood. Now, does that give us permission to end something even before day 18. I'm not here to give permission. I'm here to give guidance to the word of God and say to you that ask God. Go to him and ask him, Lord, where do you want me on this? Not God, this is where I want to be. Will you bless it? Don't do that ever. Say, God, where do you want me? How do you want me to think? I want to think the way you think. God, give me your mind. Give me your heart on this. don't want to get lost in the weeds of any real debate on this. My desire is this, that today we're celebrating communion. None of us deserve being one with God. None of us have earned it. None of us could do something so bad or so many bad things that what Jesus did for us doesn't apply to us. He died for all, once. And he gives new life to all that will receive what he has given. And so, if there's some discomfort in you today, come and be one with Jesus and let him do in you the work that he wants to do. Let him forgive, but forgiveness requires repentance. God, the way I've been thinking about this doesn't line up with what that bald guy has said in Scripture. Okay? Wrestle with it. Come to Jesus with it, actually. And see what He wants to teach you, what He wants to show you, what He wants to heal in you. A lot of people think Jesus came to heal and do good works. No. Jesus came to give new life. And... Life abundantly. It's not just healing for some old thing that God wants to do in us today. It is a brand new life that we have in Him. And so when we come to communion, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus paid for all of my sin. Even the stuff I feel like I can't forgive myself for. He's already taken care of it. He will teach you how to forgive you. And so it's repetition. Because we tell ourselves stuff over and over again, and we repeat wrong things. God wants to repeat right things to you. Like, I love you and I died for your sin. Don't keep living in that sin. I want you to have new life. If you're mad at me for talking this morning, God bless you. I love you. If you're... Finally, the pastor said something about this. I love you. God bless you. But Scripture is what I want us making our decisions based out of. Because God reveals His incredible love for us there. So that He can reveal it here. So I want you to come. If you're mad this morning, come and be one with Jesus this morning. If you feel convicted this morning, come and be one with Jesus this morning. That's what communion is. Being one with the one who died for our sins so that we don't have to stay dead in our sin. 
Jesus died on the cross. His blood covers every one of our sins when we put our faith in him. When we repent from our old way and begin his way and learn his way. And that's discipleship that is growing in him. That is actually opening our Bible and reading the stuff we think is boring. I wish God had not hidden sometimes big, huge stuff in Leviticus. <laughs> like if he would have put it in some action-packed thriller portion of the Bible, maybe more people would read it. But there's instruction in there that is life-changing for us, if we will let it be. I'm going to pray. We're going to celebrate communion together. I'm going to give you some instruction on that. I want you to come down the center aisle, so we're going to start from the front rows and kind of work our way back. If you've never done communion before, listen, neither had the disciples when Jesus gave them communion. Some people like to say, well, you have to be a Christian to celebrate communion. Well, Jesus hadn't even died on the cross for his disciples yet. If you're here, you are following, the, following Jesus in some way because he showed up today. And I believe Jesus died for you. And so I want you to come and see. There's nothing magical. These are crackers and this is juice. No magic. This is, however... The reality that Jesus told us to do, which was remember what he accomplished for us. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for forgiveness for you. If you want that forgiveness, if you want the new life that can come only through Jesus Christ, come. If you have questions about it, come. Come to Jesus. If you need to spend some time on the altar because God has been poking you right in the heart, people will pray with you. If you don't want them to, give them the Heisman. Just it'll be, They'll leave you alone. But I want you this morning to come. If you need forgiven for something, ask Jesus. If you need forgiveness from someone else in this room specifically, don't ask Jesus, ask that person. And then ask Jesus. But communion is our opportunity to celebrate the fact that I am not dead in my sin because Jesus gave me new life. And maybe up until today you have felt dead because of decisions you have made in the past. And I'm telling you, Jesus has life for you. I'm telling you that Jesus has every single one of the little ones in our country that have been sacrificed. He has them. He knows them. He made them. And he is giving forgiveness. Will we accept it? Or will we push him away? That's your choice. Let's pray.